we know that emotion and physical space will have a huge influence on how a team could be successful and resilient. We believe there are three critical spaces that must be developed. In fact, two of these spaces already pop up in literature. Uh, front stage and backstage have already been discussed by people like Goffman in 1959. Front stage is a place where the work happens. It's how we perform and appear to the crowd. This is a minimum. Without front stage, there is no business and no team. Now, backstage, according to Goffman, is how we recover when nobody is watching. However, we've noticed something else even more important. Backstage is actually a place to foster relationships. It is where family is developed with all of the familial intricacies and nuances, usually the form of team bonding events or something like that. Now, as I've said before, these two places are well-researched and many teams likely have these two spaces. Now, there is also a third space, margin. Some writers have alluded to this. In anthropology, it is referred to as a liminal space, and Richard Swenson is the one who coined the term margin. He describes it as the space between our limits and the expectations placed upon us by society. In the rare instances we've seen it, margin is a place where teams can face hard truths. It's a place where ordinary habits are suspended in order to examine reality and come up with new ways of thinking. Now, here's a really great example from the NFL where they have really codified each of these spaces. Uh, we spoke to an expatriate linebacker, Ilya Yereshuk. He took us through a week in the life of a professional athlete in the NFL. Starting off on Sunday, game day, this is 100% front stage. The Patriots are performing for their fans, literally doing their job. A pro athlete is usually on the field for about 30 really intense minutes. Now, Monday is the review session. This is the margin. After the game, coaches and players all get together and review the game tape. Um, every play gets reviewed, rewinded, and played back over and over again. Players have every action judged, and uh, the coaches have their calls examined in this long dialogue that goes back and forth. Ilya says that there is no hiding from the truth here. Everyone sees the tape. On Monday, the team faces how they performed on Sunday and figure out what to do next. The key here is that everyone must be ready to change, and this is what makes it the margin. And Tuesday is their day off. Most train or take time for their family. Ilya talked about how sometimes they'll have a linebacker dinner for all of the linebackers and their families. This is absolutely backstage behavior. Uh, the locker room is also a type of backstage for the players. Now, the rest of the week is practice for next Sunday. This is front stage because they are trying out all of the stuff they came up with in their margin, the Monday review session. They are drilling new formations six to eight hours a day that they had came up with previously. Now, I want to point out how routine this is. The Patriots have their Monday review session, win or lose. It'll happen every Monday, no matter what. We've noticed some people create a margin ad hoc when the need to come up with something new is obvious and cannot be ignored, but very few people have actually developed it to be routine. And this is why I want to tell you Latasha Fox's story. And here's the big difference. Ilya came into a system that already had each of the spaces in place. They, uh, they meaning the Patriots, had an established margin. Latasha, on the other hand, had to build it herself. So I want to share her story on how she actually created her margin.
So Latasha was a consulting CPA, a super high performing individual and was even on the Survivor show twice. Uh, she realized she wanted something more and turned to CFA. She went through the vetting process and believed she was ready to go. She had this internal monologue on, you know, I'm good at accounting, I know people, I had this great grand opening, I literally cannot fail. This is the front stage that she was presenting. She also had help from her longtime friend, Michelle, who she met at in church. Um, and this is someone who she could turn to as a source of support. It was her friendship with Michelle that was the basis for Latasha's backstage. But the first few months did not go well. Latasha had created this persona where she cannot fail. She was externally validated by the vetting process and has a lot riding on her success because she's actually representing a minority group being an African-American woman. She was even known as the Chick-fil-A lady at church after her glamorous opening. But external pressures were making her crack and she began questioning herself. Uh, later on, she asked a personal coach to help her, but she was told that she is a black woman and the coach, being a white man, he couldn't advise her. But the least he could do is to get her in touch with people like her. And she went out and spoke to the other operators and learned that she was not alone. A lot of people felt like this. So the event that forced Latasha to change was a child was given food that had a staple in it. Latasha remembers a crisis in food safety with Chipotle where someone died from eating bad food. This happened front stage, but was a bigger trigger that made Latasha realize that corporate may not have her back all the time and that she needs to create the change. Uh, in that moment, she had a chance to create the margin. So this bad negative situation could actually be seen as a triggering opportunity. Now, at the time, Latasha had a leadership style, which she learned from her consulting days. She described it as a 30,000 feet in the air approach to see the details and the patterns and to cast vision but she didn't have the experience to know what the patterns meant, nor what details to actually pay attention to. But the staple in the food was the trigger that it made her realize that she doesn't have all the answers and that she also cannot find them alone. So Latasha brought on Michelle and a man named Antoine as her peers and confidants into a space not marked by the I cannot fail mentality, but rather by vulnerability and transparency. And now they keep a laser focus on food safety and excellence in this space. And they even created this routine session of looking at the pros and cons of all the different team members and analyzing the st their strengths and weaknesses and figuring out how they could leverage some of those or avoid some of the pitfalls, very similar to what we heard from Ilya's story. So with this new perspective and a dedicated margin, Latasha has done some really unique things like completely redefining servant leadership. Um, she has created this quid pro quo model where she cares for her team and in return all she asks for is that the team cares for her. But interestingly, the caring for her means to follow her mission, values, and visions on caring for the customers. And in return, the customers see this and they want to support the team that does this for them. And so she's created this really interesting system. Uh, and so, and now she's thriving. And she even said that her main problem isn't with retention, but how to interview 400 applicants per year. Latasha is amazing because she did all of this in a year and a half, while many don't get there at all. So now this is what we have noticed. So the x-axis is all of the three spaces and the y-axis is how much we've seen leadership invest in each space. Now, a lot of investment goes into the front stage. Quite, quite a lot, usually. And then a smaller yet considerable portion goes towards the backstage. 
And what we've also noticed, unfortunately, is that almost none goes into margin. And this should be corrected because we've seen that teams that invest heavily into the front stage are really just set up to survive. Whereas if a team invests a lot into backstage, they'll be able to thrive because they have those relationships. But what we were saying is that teams that invest into margin will actually be able to grow. And this is what we want to see more of. Um, when a margin is an acknowledged uh, leaders who may find themselves in Latasha's situation may not recognize it or they may see it and won't know what to do. And so that's why we want to see the margin being a little bit more recognized. Now, the reason why creating a margin is hard is that there's a number of hurdles in the way. So from the front stage, there is this dissonance between saying, I cannot fail that we heard from Latasha versus this idea of, I don't have all the answers and I need to be more adaptable. And sometimes this idea of I cannot fail, sometimes this is fueled by a corporate brand or sometimes it's caused by an internal identity like having a leadership style based on immutable authority. Now, the backstage hurdle is leading with emotion. And so the positive version of this is honestly it's the familial bonds that we've heard of um it's and so the so the problem the hurdle is that it, a, a lot of times we see that people are trying to protect the strong family bonds that have been formed from being threatened and that we're saying that backstage is critical to form relationships but without reflection these relationships could actually inhibit a margin from forming because people don't won't want them to change once they've reached a certain level of comfort. And then the negative version of this is what we've heard of people trying to weed out bad apples. And um, it's trying to weed out bad apples without actually examining the circumstances of why they should be doing that in the first place or what are some of the systemic problems that could be causing bad apples to appear. And margin really is the only space where we suspend the norms that create these hurdles for ourselves. And so to overcome the hurdles and to be successful, we've seen that the greatest teams know when to go into the margin and in some cases make it routine.